Before we get into another volume of Sandman, allow me to plug a little something something. It's called Destructo Boy and Other Exciting Tales. It's a about 40 page anthology comic book that I made earlier this year and it'll hopefully be going on sale pretty soon, sometime soon, I'm not sure when. Uh, I'll release a video on it when I have more information. But look forward to hearing a lot about that. I'll provide links if you're at all interested. Here's some artwork to look at. Jeez, can you believe it's already been over two years since my last video on the first volume of Sandman? I can't. But finally, after two long years of people asking me to cover Sandman Volume 2, I've finally gotten to it. Maybe, eventually, I'll do the next volume of Ultimate Spider-Man. It's a Christmas miracle. Yeah, I guess this is my holiday special for this year. Released in 1989, written by Neil Gaiman with art by Mike Dringenberg, Michael Zuli, Chris Pacolo, and Malcolm Jones III, this is Sandman Volume 2. The Doll's House. Burgess grabs the book and says that come next full moon, no one will ever die again. Will coin and sun, knife and stick, claw and name, blood and feather here in darkness. We summon you together. Come. And a figure sporting a large black cloak and a massive helmet that kind of looks like a space jockey helmet from Alien falls limp into the circle. Burgess says, We failed. This isn't death. Before he grabs the large red gem, a bag of sand, and disrobes the shadowy figure, leaving the Lord of the Dream World naked in a circle. Dream has been imprisoned for 39 years in London. Unity Kincaid was raped seven years prior and gave birth to a baby girl. The baby was adopted, and Unity slept through the whole ordeal. In America, Wesley Dodds becomes the Sandman, a vigilante that puts villains to sleep and sprinkles sand on them for police to find. An idea that came to him in his dreams. Alex Burgess, having taken over for his father who died a decade prior, lives with his partner Paul McGuire. Paul pleads with Alex to free the pale man in their basement, but Alex assures him that they're much safer with him down there. Later, Alex offers Dream the same deal as his father, immortality for Dream's freedom. Dream slowly looks up at Alex, and from his pale lips comes a single, No. For the next 18 years, Alex tries again and again to get Dream to speak. And as Alex is wheeled out of the room, the tire interrupts the circle in the ground. Then he opens a portal into the Dreaming and enters it. Dream has finally been freed, and he weakly makes his way through people's dreams, eating and acquiring clothing. And now, all that's left are his tools and revenge. All over the world, people begin to awaken. He sifts through the sand, trying to put off his inevitable meeting with Morningstar. Then he takes one weird Dr. Seuss foot off the dock as he plunges downward into the darkness and into hell. So where's your crown? A demon stole it. I've got to get it back. Morpheus looks out upon the sea of demons and sends out his sand to find the culprit. And Kronzen says that he traded it to a mortal fair and square, and under the laws of hell, he's in the right. Then he says that Dream must fight him for it, and as the challenged, he gets to choose the battlefield. The world turns into a nightclub called the Hellfire Club, and Dream takes the stage with a strapping fedora, and Karanzin says, So, if you win, I return your helmet. If you lose, you serve as a plaything of hell for eternity. Our slave. Morpheus is granted his helm and thanks the three for being so honorable. Later, after walking through the rain, John D arrives at a 24-hour diner. He enters, grabs a seat, and asks for a cup of coffee while he waits for the end of the world. Hour 24. Dream finally arrives. Hello, I'm glad to see you here. It was starting to get a bit boring, but you don't look strong enough to make it even interesting, do you? As the world tears itself apart, Morpheus asks what John Dee is doing with the Dreamstone, and he tells Dream that he's using it to enter the world's deepest dreams to dredge up the blackness from their souls. I killed him. Whoever he was. The ruby's gone too. 
I'm the king of dreams of everything. And it's revealed that the white void is actually the hand of dream, who looks down upon the tiny little John D and says, Thank you, John D. It has been so long. I forgot how much power I had in the dream. What are you gonna do to me? I'm not sure. There is so much to do in my kingdom. I have found the souls I saw, though not how I imagined. From dreams, I conjure a handful of yellow grain. I throw the grain into the air, and I hear it. The sound of wings. The story begins in a desert. Two African men walk through the endless dunes. They are on a journey to bring the younger man into manhood. They stop, and the older man sits down and asks for some firewood. Then the grandfather tells his grandson to go find something and bring it back to him. He says that his grandson will know what it is when he finds it. So the young man starts looking around, and he finds it. A blue glass heart buried beneath the sand. Grandson brings it back to the campfire and asks what exactly it is. The grandfather then takes it from him, and explains that it was once part of a great lost city. When this city existed, what is now desert was once a fertile grassland with fruit trees and animals aplenty. In this paradise, a great city of glass housed the first people. The first people would eventually go on to become those of the tribe we see here now. In the city, there ruled a beautiful queen called Nada. She ruled wisely and well, but she never took a husband. But one day... A stranger came into town dressed in all black with eyes like stars. At night, he went to the foot of the queen's tower and looked up upon her. She looked back down, and her heart was stolen, and that night she did not sleep. When morning came, she demanded the stranger be brought to her, but the stranger could not be found. After the citizens of the glass city were unable to find the stranger, Queen Nada went out into the forest and found the King of Birds. So the Bird King asks every bird in existence if they've ever seen the stranger, but they're all like, Brock? Nope. But there was one bird so tiny that the king overlooked it, and when asked if she had seen the stranger, the little bird nodded and said that the stranger had given her some grain to eat before vanishing. Bird King freaks out and tells Nada that this stranger is neither a man or a god and pleads that she forget all about it and just find a human to love. Nada left and lied down next to a river and the little bird whispered in her ear about a special tree of fire that houses a certain kind of berry. If a human swallows this berry, it will take them to their true love. So the little bird goes and gets one of the berries and brings it back to her. She returned to her palace and ate the berry, and then fell into a deep sleep. Queen Nada then walked up to the House of Dream and made her way inside, where she found Kaikul on his throne. I hope I'm saying that name correctly. I didn't bother looking it up. Who are you? Why have you come here? She tells the man seated on his throne that she seeks a stranger that she loves. Then... Kaikul removes his helmet, and she sees that he is the stranger. Shocker, I know, who could have seen that coming? Then she began coughing uncontrollably, and out came the berry she had swallowed. Nada awoke in her bedroom, and standing before her was Dream. Nada tells him that she loves him more than any mortal man, but she fled because it is not given to mortals to love the endless. Only disaster can follow from a human loving one. Never have I seen another woman I would take for my own. Nada became afraid and then pulled away from him. She took the form of a gazelle and ran off, but Dream hunted her down. Then she took the form of herself and fled into the mountains where she... used a rock to make her not a virgin. Ugh, because if, if she's not a virgin, then Kaikul will no longer want her. <laughs> she passes out for obvious reasons, and when she awakes, Dream is before her. 
He tells her that he is no man, and that her body means nothing to him. Then he healed her damaged sex, and took her in his hand and drew her into his black robe. And that night, they stayed together, and everything that dreamed that night dreamed of love. The next morning, the two were together atop a mountain, and then the sun got pissed at that the Endless was with a human, so it sent a great big fireball down to the city of glass, raising it to the ground, leaving the desert strewn with shards of glass. Overtaken by guilt, Nada embraced Dream before plunging herself off the mountaintop. After she died, her spirit awoke along the borders of the realm of death and found Dream waiting for her. You hurt me. You could have but instead, you chose the realm of Grandmother Death. Once more, I will offer you my love. Once more, that is all. And if you refuse me a third time, I will condemn your soul to eternal pain. So I ask you, sweet love, for the last time, Nada looks up at Dream and asks how she can be the queen when her people and city are gone. Then she walks away from him into the realm of Grandmother Death, and Dream begs her one last time to be his bride. Then the grandfather stands up and says that this is the end of the story as their tribe knows it. He hands his grandson the heart-shaped glass and tells him to just chuck it out into the desert, because perhaps one day his son or grandson will find the same peace. Then the two men return to their tribe. Cut to the Twilight Realm of Desire. Desire walks through their palace and comes across a trophy room of sorts containing a book, an onk, Dream's Mask, a ring, and some sort of painting. Desire kisses Dream's Mask and then takes a ring and places it on their finger, calling their sibling to them. The disgustingness that is despair appears, and Desire tells her that they have news of Dream. Desire says that Nada was a mistake, but now things have changed, and now something called a Vortex of Dreaming has appeared, and there is a woman. Cut to an airplane preparing to land at Gatwick, England. I can't wait for people to tell me I pronounced that incorrectly. Rose Walker is awoken by her mother, and after they disembark the plane, they find a fancy lawyer waiting to pick him up. Rose's mother asks why she was invited out to England, and the lawyer says that his client will explain everything when they arrive. Sometime later, they are driving out to the countryside, and Rose falls asleep in the back seat, in the dreaming. Lucian, Dream's assistant, finishes taking a consensus of all the dream entities, and finds out that four of the major arcana are simply gone. Name them. A brute and glob of your palace staff, sire. They vanished a few decades ago. I never trusted them, my lord. It was not in their nature to be trustworthy. Who else is missing? Well, uh, the Corinthian. I see. That would be bad news. The Corinthian is not the most social of nightmares. And before Fiddler's Green. He's not in the dream world. I checked twice. These are all disturbing absences, Lucian. I did not like this. Four puissant creatures escaped from the dreaming. I blame myself. Had I been here fulfilling my function? It was not your fault, my lord. No. The two then walk through the palace, and Lucian brings up rumors of a dream vortex appearing. Dream says that the rumors are true. It does exist. And Lucian says that he must hunt for it and control it. But Dream tells him that there is no need for alarm. The vortex is a she, not an it. And if he looks closely, Lucian will see her observing them right now. Rose wakes up as the car arrives at a large manor a private nursing home for the elderly. Miranda and Rose are led into the home and to the lawyer's client, Unity Kincaid. Unity is Miranda's mother and Rose's grandmother. 
Miranda and Unity talk as Rose leaves the room, and then she hears a little psst from down the hall. She goes to the door and creaks it open and enters a very dark room. And inside she finds, oh fuck, it's these three. The Norns tell Rose that she is at a crossroads and to be aware of dreams and houses. The three say that if Rose asked the right question, they would have warned her about the Corinthian, told her about her brother Jed, and of Morpheus, and then they disappear. Rose is like, what the fuck just happened? And then she walks back out into the hall and finds her mother and grandmother. Unity gives Rose a Cliff Notes or Spark Notes. Which reference is more popular among youth? Do people still use either of those websites? Anyway, Unity gives her a rundown of her backstory and then she looks over at her large dollhouse. And inside the top story window is a teeny tiny little dream watching them. Then her grandmother gives Rose a ring and she recognizes it from her dreams. She asks what is happening to her. Who were those women in the broom closet? What's with Jed? Why do kids love the taste of Cinnamon Toast Crunch? What's the Corinthian? Cut to the Love Inn Motel, Amarillo, Texas. You want any more wine? Just ring room service. I will. Thank you. That's good. You took my advice. Didn't go anywhere. Listen, mister, I said I didn't mind the kinky stuff, but listen, you untie me, you untie me, and I'll, I'll do whatever you want, please. Davy, I said we were going to play, didn't I? Yeah, just, just, just play, just play, that's right. <laughs> oh, oh, no. Now, oh, Davy. Oh, no. It's playtime. Sometime later in Florida, Rose moves into the second story home of her new landlord, Hal Carter. Hal introduces her to her housemates, Ken and Barbara, get it, Zelda and Chantel, collectors of dead spiders, and Gilbert, but he's on the top floor and spends most of his time either up there or out of the house, so you don't really see him that often. Rose is then taken to her bedroom and Hal asks why she moved to Florida for. Rose tells her that she came to find her brother, who she hasn't seen in seven years. Hal then leaves, and as he closes the door, a raven lands at the windowsill. Cut to the land of marvelous dreams. Two superheroes, Hector Hall, Hector Hall the Sandman, and Lyta, a superhero called Fury, who is also the daughter of Wonder Woman and Steve Trevor from another Earth, go on a flying adventure with this little boy. You see, this boy is Jed. Rose's brother. And Jed was created by Joe Simon and Jack Kirby in their original Sandman comic, as were these two characters in the hot air balloon, Brute and Glob. Brute and Glob's skooky bird flies out of their hands and begins tickling Jed until he loses his grip from Sandman and begins falling out of the sky, and he lands in a cold, dark basement. Shut up, you little bastard, or I'll really give you something to scream about. Jed bites the inside of his cheek to keep from sobbing aloud. He whimpers nervously, deep in his throat. The floor is uncomfortable, and his bladder aches. Jed extends an arm to the wall, walks carefully through the dark to the corner of the basement. He urinates in the corner. The smell that rises from the hole makes him gag. Then he curls up on the damp dirt floor, under his ragged blanket. And for a few more fleeting hours, Jed escapes. And he lands atop Brute's hot air balloon. Sandman grabs his hand, and he and his wife, Lyta, then fly him back down to the Dream Dome. Dear Mom. Hi, Will. I've been here for a, a couple days so far. Hope you and Grandma Unity are fine. I'm staying in the house Unity's people found near Cape Canaveral. It's sort of weird here. I mean, I keep feeling like I've strayed into a remake of the Adams Family. The house, and my room, is great, but the other tenants... Downstairs are a couple called Ken and Barbie. They're normal, terrifyingly, appallingly normal. Like they've gone through normal and come out the other side. The Stepford Yuppies. Right, the room across the hall contains the spider woman, Zelda and Chantel. I don't know their last name. Nobody seems to know if they're mother and daughter, sisters, lovers, business partners, or what. They dress in white and collect dead spiders. Chantel says they have over 24,000. Zelda never says anything. 
I only hope that their spiders are all dead. If I find a spider in my bathtub, I am not going to check its catalog number before screeching discreetly and flushing it down the drawn. Upstairs is Gilbert. Gilbert, as far as I can tell, is a disembodied presence who haunts the attic room. I've heard his voice, booming down the stairwell. Never seen him, though. What he was saying was that he wanted Hal to bring him a six-foot-long pencil, since he was going to stay in bed for a week and wished to draw on the ceiling. Weird, huh? And he sounds British to me, Unity. Fruit Loops from the mother country. At least Hal, our landlord, is normal. Huh? The gall of that! If he's so clever, what is he doing directing a drag show? No talent! Man! He's cut my tribute to Sondheim and given an extra number to that slut Mitzi! I told him, I don't care who you're screwing, but if Broadway baby goes, then so do I! Asshole! Well, relatively normal anyways. Oh, another tenant showed up when I did. He, or she, is a big raven, I think, who has been hanging around outside my window. Hal says I ought to charge him rent on my window ledge. Yesterday I went to the lighthouse on Dolphin Island. I spent this morning in the courthouse going through the county records. This is what I got. When dad died, and why couldn't anyone have let us know? I mean, I would have liked the option to refuse to go to his funeral. Jed definitely went to live with our grandfather, my father's father. Ezra Polson, lighthouse keeper on the island. Grandfather, I wish I met him. He sounds like a nice old guy. Looks like Santa Claus and oil skins in the photo. Looked after Jed, but Grandpa drowned about four years back. He was 82, so where's Jed? Don't know yet. And that's all I've got so far. I'll keep looking. All my love to both of you. Rose. In the dreaming, Matt the Raven flies to Dream's hand and informs him of the dullness of his mission to watch Rose. He also says he feels a little creepy watching this young woman all the time. And Dream's like, Toughen up, Buttercup. She is the dream vortex. She'll attract stray dreams to her. Or she'll be drawn to them. Matthew tells him that Rose is still looking for her little brother and then flies away, and Dream asks for more information on the boy, and instructs Matthew to bring a photo of him back. Sometime later, Rose walks down the street from the drag review that Hal was starring in. I've been in town for five days now. I found more about Jed. He was sent to live with relatives when Grandfather died. My late father, the skunk side of the family. I've been to see Dolly's show. That was what Hal called himself when he was herself. I thought I knew the town and I didn't. For example, I thought that the alley was a shortcut back to the house. Here, kitty, 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 you are left to your bedtime. Here, kitty, kitty, pretty kitty <laughs> wanna play with us? Kitty, kitty, now, kitty, money first, then we do the thing. Don't touch me. Ooh, kitty's got a temper. Gentlemen, it would seem to me that the young lady desires to retain both her purse and honor. You'll excuse me if I intrude. Rose and the large man then leave as the skinheads limp away. She thanks him, introduces herself, and the large man realizes that she is the downstairs lodger, and Rose realizes that this man is Gilbert. He then accompanies her home. Home in the Dream Dome, Sandman and Lyta thank Jed for helping them save the world from the Toad Dancers, and Lyta says that when her son is born, Jed will have a new friend to play with. They leave, and Jed looks at a large orb with little, like, gerbils inside. So he presses a button and accidentally lets them out. Then they begin multiplying, and the verbal gerbils become more and more until Jed is swarmed. He cries out for help as a rat bites his cheek. Jed rips it off his face, and the rat stabs into his hand, causing Jed to relinquish the vermin across the dark room. He holds his hand and cries. At the lodge, Hal teaches Rose how to dance, when suddenly, a raven swoops into the open window, grabs a photo of Jed and his grandfather, and flies away. Gilbert then comes through the door and informs Rose that someone is on the phone for her. He believes it to be the private investigator she hired to help her find Jed. Thank you, Matthew. This is strange. The boy 
is in the realm of the living, but I cannot find him. I must return to the center of the dreaming. Wait in Eve's cave, Matthew. I shall call you if I need for you. There is more to this than meets the eye. Slow. Methodically, I began to search for the boy afresh. Each human is connected to the dreaming. They spend a third of their lives in this realm. I wonder fleetingly which one of them could be responsible. To break the connection would take power. And knowledge. Fiddler's green. Brute and glob. The Corinthian. Hello? Is this Nimrod? I've heard on the grapevine about some kind of get-together for people who share our specialized interests. Uh-huh. I don't need to write it down. I don't forget things. Shoot. Okay. That's this weekend, then? Yes, I'll be free. So, where, exactly? Georgia, huh? Nice state. Sure, I know the town. I know America like the back of my hand. I'm part of the American dream. A name to register under. Put me down as the Corinthian. Well, that's very kind of you to say so. I admire your work as well. It'll be good to meet up with some kindred spirits. Indeed. No. Thank you. Goodbye, boys. Back in Florida, Rose says bye to Hal before setting off on a road trip. Then she walks outside to her rental car and finds Gilbert waiting for her. He says he wishes to accompany her as he worries for a young woman traveling alone, and thus he shall take his role as an amateur knight errant. The two drive down the highway as Rose informs Gilbert of Jed's location, some farm in upstate Georgia living with their father's cousins. Jed sleeps, tied to a hook in the basement. Sandman and Jed fight against the evil Dr. Lobster. Jed sleeps in the basement. Found him. How dare they? How dare they? Brute and globe. This has their stink about it, Lucian. How dare they? They severed this child from the dreaming. They are living in his mind, Lucian. They know the law. My law. And they wanted me to fight. Did they think they could hide from me? I do not know what game they are playing, but I know this. I am angry. And it is my move. In the Dream Dome, Lyta is awoken. She walks solemnly out of their bedroom down the spiraling stairs and as an alarm system whoops and shrills. Hector Hall, the same man, is busy at work. She wonders how different things will be once their child is born. It's a ten alarm nightmare, and it's heading this way! Batter down the hatches, team. This is going to be a doozy. Brute? Glob? Either of you guys ever seen anything like this before? Uh, yeah, sure. We know what that is, Mr. Sanford. The first Sandman. He had a battle with this guy once. It's uh, called, uh... The Nightmare uh, Monster is a terrible creature from the, uh, Underid, one of your hereditary foes. Then I'll have to show it what the new Sandman is made of. Isn't that right, honey? Hector. I'm sorry, Hector. I was thinking. Thinking about something. I'm sorry. Listen, you two. That thing will be here soon. Give me any files we have on it. Oh, heck! We were due to take little Jed to the circus and the stars tonight. If it takes more than a couple hours to thrash this critter, we'll have to put that off until tomorrow night. Got it. Okay, boss. Hector walks Lyda back upstairs and she asks, Darling, how long have we been living in the Dream Dome? 
There must be a couple of years by now, hun. Why? Well, it just seemed to me like maybe I ought to have a baby by now. I was about six months pregnant when we got here. You know, you could just have something there, baby cakes. Hmm. You know what? I'll bet that stork doesn't even know how to get to the Dream Dome. He's probably got our little bundle of joy in its white cotton diaper right now. I'll tell Brute and Glob about it. They'll know how to get a message to that old stork. I'll talk to them right after I've beaten this nightmare monster. Be careful. Now listen up, you little monster, you little animal, and you listen good. Next week, someone's gonna be coming from the welfare department to see how you're doing. See if they're getting their money's worth out of you. So, we're gonna clean you up and bring you up out of the cellar, and you're gonna show her Barnaby Jr.'s room and make it out to yours. And tell her how well we feed you and all, and none of your lying! <coughs> Feel this, <coughs> huh? Do ya? Now get! Hector informs Lyta that he's about to embark upon the Nightmare Monster, and she tells him to have a good time. Meanwhile, Brute and Glob wonder what they should do now that Dream has discovered their machinations. Cut to somewhere in the middle of Georgia. Rose's rental has broken down, and the two of them trek to a motel that they passed. The egg-headed shaped clerk informs them that, unfortunately, the entire motel is booked for the weekend for some sort of serial convention, although he decides to allow them to stay the night in the rooms of two guests who don't arrive until morning. Come on, you dumb nightmare monster. It's defeating the forces of darkness time. Something's happening. <laughs> There's something happening in my head. I'm sorry. I'm sorry. I won't try and run away again anymore. Please. There's something happening. Please let me help. Please. <coughs> Hello? Brute? Glob? Hector? What's happening? Hell? No. Okay, I got it. We get out of the dreaming while he's busy with the bozo. We yo, we cut open Barnaby and Clarice, scoop out their insides and hide in the skin. He'd never think of looking for us there. He would. Yeah, he would. Hold, foul nightmare creature, or I will disperse your fabric with my ultrasonic whistle. So that doesn't phase you, huh? Well, let's see how you react to a cartridge of dream sand! Sha -sha -sha. Get out of my way! Monster, you shall never get past me. And who are you? I am the Sandman, guardian of the dreams of men, protector against wicked nightmares, lord of the dream dome, and friend of children everywhere. Clarice, you hear something. Sounded like it came from the basement. If it's that little son of Out of 
the picture, Lord, so we thought, hell, you'd be away for a while, so we could maybe make our own Dream King, one we'd be running. Uh, we hid in the kids' dreams and walled it off from the rest of the dreaming. Then we made a Sandman. First mortal we used, Garrett Sanford. He cracked, killed himself, couldn't take the strain. We thought, okay, next time we'll get someone who's already dead to start with. So we hooked the bozo, told him he was a new Sandman, and he brought his wife along. But then you played your little get-out-of-jail-free card earlier than we expected, and we all are. Uh, what happens now? I will clean up the mess you have created. As for you two, I doubt that either of you will enjoy the next few thousand years very much. <laughs> Fella, I'm Hector Hall, and this is my wife, Polita. I don't know what this is all about, but... It is unseemly for the dead to walk the earth, Hector Hall. You belong with the dead, little ghost. Hey, now listen, Buster. Go to the place appointed for you. Oh, hey, Lyda, stop him! Stop him! For God's sake, do something! Hector! You killed him, you monster. <sighs> he died a long time ago. I would suggest that you count yourself lucky for having had two extra years with you instead of abusing me. You killed him! If you wish. Ah! So. What are you going to do to me? Nothing. Nothing. You killed Hector. You destroyed our home. You've ruined my life. You call that nothing? Exactly. Nothing. You are free to go. Build yourself a new home. A Oh, I almost forgot. The child. But, but, you can't take my baby. I have a prior engagement, I'm afraid. I can discuss this no further. I will see you again, Epanta. Until then, farewell. You can take my child over my dead body, you spooky bastard. Over my dead body. Later that night, Jed walks alongside the highway in the rain, having escaped the farmhouse earlier in the day. A car pulls to the side of the road and picks him up. Jed thanks the driver for giving him a ride, and then he asks why the man's wearing sunglasses at night. Cut to the motel hosting the cereal convention. Cereal enthusiasts arrive in droves. The next morning, the convention organizer informs everyone to receive their badges and registration packs from the table and tries to figure out if everyone has arrived. The organizer then goes to the motel owner's office and asks if everything is going as planned. The owner says that, yeah, most of everything, except for uh, these two guests who are meant to leave in the morning, but uh, when they learn something that happened to their family, they were told by the sheriff to stay here in case the police needed them. Meanwhile, Rose stands in her room, freaking out about Jed. So she walks across the hall to Gilbert's room. He lets her in, and they talk about what the sheriff said. Gilbert asks if she'd like him to tell her a story. So he quickly explains the origins of Red Riding Hood and then tells her the original story. A little girl was told to bring bread and milk to her grandmother. 
As she was walking through the wood, a wolf came up to her and asked her where she was going. The wolf ran off and arrived first at the house. He killed the grandmother, poured her blood into a bottle, and sliced her flesh onto a plate. Then he got into her night clothes and waited in the bed. Knock, knock. Come in, my dear. I've brought you some bread and milk, grandmother. Have something yourself. My darling, there's meat and wine in the pantry. The little girl ate what was offered, and as she did, a little cat said, Slut, to eat the flesh and drink the blood of your grandmother. Then the wolf said, Undress and get into bed with me. Where shall I put my skirt? Throw it on the fire. You won't need it any more, for each garment, petticoat, bodice, stockings. The girl asked the same question, and the wolf replied, Throw it on the fire. You won't need it any more. When the girl got into the bed, she said, Grandmother, how hairy you are. It keeps me warm, my dear. Oh, Grandmother, what long nails you have. They are for scratching myself, my dear. Oh, Grandmother, what big teeth you have. They are for eating you, my dear. And then he ate her. Gilbert, that's horrible. I'm afraid so. There are earlier versions that are even worse. Listen to the wind. It brings bad things, Rose Walker. I think it will be best if we keep to our rooms. Inside the motel, Mr. Nimrod asks Funland how they're doing. Funland informs him that 80 people have registered so far, but Family Man still hasn't shown up yet. Unfortunately, the Family Man was supposed to be the guest of honor. Nimrod asks if they have any other big names when the Corinthian rocks up. Funland fanboys and asks for his autograph, and Nimrod asks if Corinthian will be their new guest of honor. And later, Nimrod prepares to go before the convention audience. Pull yourself together. You're the chairman of the convention committee. You're a successful orthodontist. You'll have a shack with four full chest freezers. And the joke. Tell them the joke. <clears throat> Hello. Uh, I, uh... I heard a story recently, and I thought it uh, might amuse you all. It seems that the telephone rang in a police station. The deputy cop answers, and a woman's voice says, Help! I've been raped! He says, Don't you mean raped? No! She says, He used a scythe! <laughs> Nimrod goes over the rules for the convention. No civilian names, don't eat shit where you eat, some other stuff. Then he introduces the Corinthian. Later, as the convention goes on, a red-headed man called Boogeyman meets an older man who is a doctor. And later, Rose and Gilbert take the elevator downstairs to head out for doing something. I don't know what they're doing. On another floor, Corinthian and the doctor discuss the red-headed man, who the doctor believes is a fraud and isn't truly the Boogeyman. Corinthian agrees and says that the real boogeyman died three years ago. The elevator stops and is then boarded by the doctor and the Corinthian. And as it continues down, Rose checks him out as Gilbert begins to sweat and shake and freak out. The two get out and Corinthian says that they need to let Nimrod know about this. And in the parking lot, Rose asks what Gilbert was so afraid of. A raven flies above them as he tells her that he cannot say. Then he brings out a notebook, writes a name on it, and gives it to her. He instructs her to read it to herself now, and if things ever get bad, to call out the name. I, uh, I, I really dance. You know, my mom does ballroom dancing since she retired. Says it gets her out of the house. Not me, though. Oh, yeah. I only go to discos when I'm hunting. Oh, gosh. I wouldn't hunt in places like that. I have this place. <coughs> Pardon me. I can't tell anyone else where it is because, well, <laughs> you, you'd all want to go there. Oh, it's a great place. Like thousands of people, and there are always beautiful little children wandering off on their own, getting lost. Always so pleased to see somebody friendly. And quiet places to take them to, even in the middle of crowds, where no one will disturb you before you've finished. And what's great is the people who run the place always hush it up. 
They don't want anyone to know that I'm there either. They don't want people to stop going. They want everybody to be happy. Just like me. It's a wonderful place. My secret special place. And the other thing I love, if you can't find any beautiful children to play with, you can always go on the rides. I'm, I'm sorry ma'am, this is a convention function. You can't go in. Um, uh, River, how old would you say she was? That little girl. Do you repeat? I don't know. Girl. 17, maybe 18? Oh, really? I think she looks younger. Much younger. Boy, Rosie, you're a real screaming success on this one. Not only did you not find Jed, but you lost Gilbert and Root. Pat yourself on the back. Three cheers for Rose. Hello? Hey, it's room service, and your grandmother's on the phone. What? Unity? It's not really room service. It's me. We're going to play, little girl. We're going to make, make, make believe it's my special place. Now, when we're finished, you mustn't tell anybody that I played with you. Especially not Mr. Nimrod. He said that dirty stuff about what we don't do where we eat. Um, I love you, little girl. I love you to death. You can, you can take off your dress. No, you don't need it anymore. Marvius. I hope you didn't say anything dirty. I hate dirty little girls. I call them sluts. Let go of her. They bit to skin. Let go of her. No, she's mine. We were playing. She isn't yours, Nathan. She belongs to no one except perhaps herself. usually speak in public, but the opportunity was too good to pass up, because you are all special people. Very special people. We are the American dreamers, driving down the holy road to true knowledge that's paved with blood and gold. We don't do what we do to make a living. We don't do it for revenge. We don't kill people anonymously, poisoning their aspirin, putting shards of glass in baby food. We don't drive cars onto sidewalks, carry guns into burger joints, and blast away. We do not murder for profit. We do not murder for governments or for hire. We kill to kill. We are entrepreneurs in an expanding field. <laughs> we, we are, we are gladiators. We are soldiers of, of fortune. We, uh, we are the living. Let's say, uh, to triumph, our triumph and glory. You disappoint me, Corinthian. You and these humans you inspired and created disappoint. You are my masterpiece. Or so I thought. A nightmare created to be the darkness and the fear of darkness in every human heart. A black mirror made to reflect everything about itself that humanity will not confront. But look at you. Forty years walking the earth, owning yourself, infecting others with your joy of death. And what will you give them? Nothing. Just something for the people to be scared. 
scared are. That's all. You've told them that there are bad people out there. And they've known that all along. So what now? You You expect me to submit quietly? To return to the dream that started his sleepy minds. Never again did the know the lights of the street all eyes as it pops between my teeth. Is that it? No, that's not it. Then let us fight you more. Put on your helm, let me show you the arts of pain and war I have learned. No, Corinthian. We shall not fight. You shall not go back to the dreaming. It is my fault. As I do uncreate you now. No. No. The next time I make you, you shall not be so flawed and petty little dream. And you, you that call yourselves collectors, until now you have all sustained fantasies in which you are the maltreated hero. You? Collect yourself, Miss Walker. It is only me. I think this uh, is your brother. I found him locked in the boot of a car. He's unconscious, but still alive. We urgently need to get him to a hospital. I don't know what happened here today, Gilbert. You called him, didn't you? I suppose we will both have to face the consequences of that. In the meantime, I think we should call an ambulance for the boy and then make our way home. Sometime later, Rose returns to her Florida home from the hospital. Hal asks how Jed is doing, and Rose tells him that he's still in a concussion. Her housemates all give their condolences, and then Rose heads upstairs to her bedroom. And as her housemates sleep, she tosses and turns, begging herself to sleep, to dream. Elsewhere, Gilbert makes his way through the Brevard County Hospital and sits in Jed's room beside him. In the dreaming, Dream speaks to Matthew and instructs him to go to the hospital for there is someone there that Matthew must bring him. Dream then sets off to deal with the Dream Vortex before them. As Rose floats through the Dream Vortex, dreams from around the city and soon the world begin to conjoin and mesh and integrate together, changing the dreamers forever. But luckily, Dream shows up just in time to stop the Vortex. He grabs Rose and introduces himself to her. And in England, Unity wakes up at 4.30 a.m. and tells Miranda that she wants Rose to have her dollhouse. In the dreaming... Dream flies with Rose across the cloudscape of mines. He flies her to a barren desert, and they rest atop a withered away piece of mountain. Meanwhile, Matthew arrives at the hospital and enters Jed's room. He speaks, assuming that no one there can hear him, and is shocked when Gilbert reveals that he can. Gilbert says he's been waiting for someone like him to come and take him back home, although he always imagined that it would be Dream himself that would be the one to do it. Gilbert stands up, cleans off his hat, and laments all the things of being alive that he will miss. He says that he may miss Rose Walker the most. And Matthew's like, You mean, you mean the Vortex? Gilbert is surprised by this reveal, but supposes that he probably should have realized it sooner. Matthew says that Dream is handling it, and then asks Gilbert how he deals with the Vortexes. Gilbert tells him that Dream terminates the Vortex's physical existence to protect the Dreaming. Then they disappear. You are a Vortex. And you're saying because of this, this vortex, whatever the hell that means, you're going to kill me? Is that what you're saying? Yes, that is what I am saying. You're kidding, right? You saved my life in that crazy hotel with that crazy fat guy, and now you're going to kill me? I can't believe this. I, this is just a dream. 
What am I worried about? Sooner or later, I'll just wake up. Rose. I'm sorry, but you are mistaken. You are right. This is a dream, but not a dream from which you will wake it. Not now. Not ever. Rose. I don't understand it, but I believe it. Just tell me one thing. Why me? Once in every era, there is a vortex. I do not know why, but a mortal briefly becomes the center of the dream. The vortex by nature destroys the barriers between dreaming minds. Destroys the ordered chaos of the dreaming. Until Vortex collapses. It takes the minds of the dreamers with it. It damages the dreaming beyond repair. It leaves nothing but darkness. But, but if you're like the king of this place, can't you just, I don't know, magic whatever this is out of me? Rose Walker? Are you there? Gilbert! Thank God! This man says he's going to kill me! Fiddler's Green? Why did you leave? I rely on you. I trust you. You are the heart of the dream. I left because I was curious and because I was tired. Life as a human contains substance I never dreamed of in the dreaming lore. My lord. I offer my life for hers. That is not an option. The girl must die that the dreaming may survive. I am sorry, Fiddler's Green. I cannot find it in my heart to punish you for leaving. Not now. However, it is time you take your appointed position once again. Say. I must apologize to you, Miss Walker, for not being a very good human, not even a good copy of a human. And now, when you need me the most, it seems I have failed you. Farewell, my dear. You were the best thing about being human. After death, if you do stay in the dream, please visit. I am sorry, Rose. There's nothing personal about this. For Christ's sake, just do it. Stop friggin' apologizing and just do whatever it is you're going to do! Dream prepares to vanquish Rose's life, but as he does, a voice comes from behind them. The voice of Unity Kincaid, who says that Rose will not die tonight. She will. Dream orders her to leave this place, and Rose tells him to shut it, and says that she should have been the Vortex, but it didn't happen because Dream was imprisoned. Unity asks Rose to give her her heart, so, Rose pulls out this large gem, ruby, crystal heart from her bare chest and hands it to Unity. Unity holds it in her hands and rips it apart. She falls to the ground and Dream helps her back up before telling Rose that there's a lot going on that even he isn't too sure about. Then he wakes her up. That was six months ago. What's happened since? I got a letter from Hal the other week. Hal selling his house, moving out west. Reading between the lines, I think he's met someone, but he didn't actually come out and say it. He said that Ken and Barbie split. 
Kang got himself a new partner who looks exactly like a younger Barbie, while Barbie's gone sort of seriously weird. Hal didn't give me any details. She's gone to stay with some friends in Manhattan. The spider women are buying the house from Hal. He said Zelda actually spoke to him the other day. No one's seen Gilbert since. We're living in a big house mom bought just outside Seattle, where she grew up. I haven't been out of my room, except to eat, preferably late at night when mom and Jed are asleep. I've been reading, playing records, sometimes just sitting, staring in space, writing this diary, or whatever it is, thinking. A year ago, my best friend died. Her name was Judy. She was killed, or perhaps she killed herself in some kind of massacre in a small town diner. She phoned me on the day she died. She just split up with her girlfriend, Donna, and she was in rough shape. I think about Judy a lot. Six months ago, I had a really weird dream. That was the night that Unity died and Jed got better. If it was true, my dream, and lots of it is sort of hazy, lots of it doesn't seem to make sense anymore, although I'm sure it did at the time, then, then nothing makes any sense. If my dream is true, then everything we know, everything we think we know, is a lie. In my dream, I could have destroyed everybody in the world. In my dream, Gilbert wasn't even a person. He was a place. In my dream, Grandma Unity gave up her life for me. Dreams are weird and stupid, and they scare me. I haven't slept properly for six months now. It's a nice house, too big, but that suits me. It means I don't have to see other people any more than I have to. That's my story, okay. It's even got a happy ending. Jed and Rose and their mother were finally reunited and they all lived together in a big old house. I've been brooding on that night for too long now, six months, and I've decided. My dream, my weird dream. It was just a dream, that's all. Just a dream. And then she woke up. You know, I always hated stories that ended like that. I always felt cheated. Six months is long enough to feel sorry for yourself, isn't it? You can't feel cheated forever. Hello, stranger. Hi, Rose. So, uh, what's the occasion? I don't know. Rejoining the human race, I suppose? I can't sit up there forever. I thought maybe I'd get some kind of job, or maybe do some traveling, hunt down some old friends. And then she woke up. I suppose there are worse endings. And in the dreaming, Dream walks through his palace and makes his way to his gallery. He holds Desire's sigil and makes his way to her dimension. Dream says that the vortex was somehow transmitted along Unity's genetic line to her granddaughter, and he deduces that someone has been meddling in his affairs. Someone named Desire, perhaps a streetcar. Dream demands to know who Rose's grandfather was. Who was it that fathered her mother? Desire skirts around the question, and Dream tells her, Remember this. We of the Endless are the servants of the living. We are not their master. We exist because they know deep in their hearts that we exist. When the last living thing has left the universe, then our task will be done. We do not manipulate them. If anything, they manipulate us. We are their toys. Their dolls, if you will. And you, and despair, and even poor delirium, should remember that. I, I don't understand. Mess with me or mine again, and I will forget you are family desire. Do you believe yourself strong enough to stand against me? Against death? Against destiny? Remember that, Sipple. The next time you feel inspired to interfere in my affairs, just remember. Dream then leaves the twilight realm of desire and Desire walks around her own body. 
smiling at how they really got under dream skin this time. The end. I hope you enjoyed this episode of What Is. If you did, make sure you like the video and leave me a comment on what you thought of the comic or just anything in general. Are there any good comics out? I don't know. What do you think of the video? I'm also, I think I'm going to start focusing on some more shorter videos and just, you know, more concise comics as opposed to things such as this. Uh, that doesn't mean I'll stop making these versions of my videos, you know, like the longer, more narrative-driven ones. Uh, they'll just be less often in hopes that I can get out more content. But, um, yeah, that's it for 2020. Uh, I'll see you next year. Have a happy holidays, and please stay safe. Uh, bye!